Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Laderman. I am the coordinator for CG's Global Policy Forum in Ottawa. Welcome to this, the third in a series of six forums. I would first like to recognize some of the uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps. The Ambassador of Algeria, His Excellency Hossein Megar, the Ambassador of Bulgaria, His Excellency Nikolai Milkov, and the Ambassador of Venezuela, His Excellency Vilmir Barrientos. We also welcome diplomatic representatives from Latvia, <coughs> Cuba, uh, from the USA, and the High Commissions of Kenya and Pakistan. I'm also pleased to welcome members of the Canadian government, including Parliament of Canada, Transport Canada, Global Affairs Canada, and the Bank of Canada, as well as students and faculty from Carleton University and the University of Ottawa. It is now my pleasure to ask the director of CG's Global Security and Politics Program, Dr. Fenn Hampson, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Fenn. Thanks very much, Larry, and it really is a, a distinct honor and privilege to uh, introduce a, a very distinguished uh, American uh, friend uh, of, uh, of Canada, uh, someone who uh, has gotten to know Canada even better since uh, his days as uh, Homeland Secretary, a position he served with great distinction from 2005 to 2009. Uh, Mr. Chertoff was uh, a member of the uh, CG-led Global Commission on Internet Governance, which uh, delivered uh, its report after two years of work and many, many meetings around the world uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Chertoff served as, uh, as uh, head of, uh, as Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, a federal judge in the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, a post he held uh, for several years, and before that, uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, of the United States, uh, where he uh, uh, worked assiduously in the uh, criminal uh, division uh, of the uh, Attorney General uh, of the United States. Um, he is uh, a, a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard College and also uh, the Harvard Law School, and when he graduated from law school, he uh, served as a clerk to uh, Supreme Court Justice Willem Brennan, Jr. And as many of you know, those, uh, those are positions that only go to the, uh, the very best and, and talented uh, of, uh, of graduates of, uh, of America's law school. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Mr. Chertoff is uh, head of uh, the Chertoff Group He's also senior counsel at uh, Covington Burlington and a member of the firm's White Collar Defense and Investigations Practice Group. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Michael, I think I can safely say Michael, uh, to, uh, to Ottawa. He's been uh, doing a, a round of presentations. Uh, earlier today, he uh, uh, gave uh, a terrific uh, talk to uh, uh, the senior deputies in the Canadian government uh, over at the Canada School. He's uh, been on television. Uh, he's done a number of uh, uh, interviews uh, with other members of the media. And um, uh, for those of you who know him, uh, he's just warming up. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, the internet, challenges of internet governance, uh, and, uh, and we'll also answer questions because, as uh, some of you know, he has uh, some uh, very mild-mannered views about the uh, American election and where it's going. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to uh, ask him uh, questions uh, uh, pretty much on any and, and every subject. So, Michael. Well, Fenn, thank you very much, and thank you for hosting me at this very distinguished and elegant club. Um, I belong to a club in Washington called the Cosmos Club, um, which I also enjoy attending events at, and uh, this reminds me very much of that. It's, it's uh, a really a pleasure to be here. You know, I begin by acknowledging this is a very important week in the United States. We're going to face the outcome of a critical contest, uh, something that's going to, in some ways, address issues that are unprecedented. 
or at least for, for, for many decades. And I know it's very much all on our minds. Um, but I'm going to ask you to put the World Series to one side for a moment. Um, even though I'm, I'm confident the Cubs will win, thereby breaking a 108-year streak, <clears throat> I don't want to count my chickens before they're hatched. Um, by the way, I'm not from Chicago, but my son did go to university there, so derivatively, I've, I've become a Cubs fan. Uh, but as I say, we'll put that to one side. You can ask me questions about it afterwards. Um, but I did want to talk about governance of the internet and how we address what is kind of a novel situation in our world, which is uh, how do nation states govern, manage, and interact with data that has no borders and which moves around without any restraint. It basically puts in opposition to our Westphalian system, which is based upon territorial control and borders puts in opposition to that a critical element now of global commerce and even of the operation of physical systems that cannot be really located anywhere because the data that carries out the functions of the internet can be moved all over the place. And I think that, as I will explain, has presented us with a number of challenges. If we can deal with these, I think, in an intelligent way, we can actually see the internet be a powerful engine of growth and also something that will help bring parts of the world that are less well developed into being better developed. But if we don't manage it right, what we will see is the end of the internet. It'll be fragmented into 50, 100 internets. And it'll be useful for things like maybe getting movies or uh, looking up uh, you know, train schedules. But the real value of the internet is a global communication and economic engine will have been squandered. So let me get back and just review a little bit about the history of the internet. You know this began decades ago as an effort on the part of academic institutions to find a way to, sh to share their scientific data uh, and particularly to do it in a way that wouldn't necessarily be compromised if there was a problem with the ordinary methods of communication. So the theory was to take the data, digitize it, break it into packets, and then come up with a system that would allow you to d direct the packets from your point of origination to the ultimate recipient, being agnostic as to the pathway that you took. There was experimentation with this. Ultimately, DARPA, which was the Defense Advanced Research Agency of the Department of Defense, funded this. And it expanded into an effort that was to really link together various defense government functions and academic institutions with resiliency in case a war broke out and you had a compromise of the normal communication systems. This was not meant to be commercial. In fact, the original terms and conditions of being part of the internet were that you didn't use it for commercial purposes. It was for academic and official purposes. But as it developed, um, a couple of individuals, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf, uh, developed a protocol that dramatically expanded the ability of the, of the internet to operate by connecting networks through a domain name system that allowed you, with a protocol, to address almost any place that could be connected based on wires from one network to another network. And that was really when the internet took off. But there were a couple of other developments about the, in, about the internet which also were very significant. And they often get less attention than that initial development of the transfer protocol. First was wireless. Before we had wireless technology, uh, although the internet could be global, it was fixed. You had to be at an endpoint that could connect up through a wire line. When we went mobile, we dramatically increased the surface area of the internet and created a circumstance where you could be almost anywhere in the world and connect up to the internet. As we'll see, that also created a, a, a risk with respect to uh, people perhaps finding a larger surface area to attack if they wanted to compromise or obtain data or otherwise interfere, they now didn't have to actually deal with the endpoint of the wire. They could simply do it any place that was wireless that would connect into the internet. A third development um, was the development of cloud storage. Now, this is a little bit of a, of a reversal <clears throat> because initially when computers first got started, all the data was held, as you know, in these big servers that were kind of uh, data uh, processing centers. 
and it was considered to be a step forward when we actually created PCs and other kinds of devices that could store data in a much smaller space, you know, run uh, substantial computing power, but you could have it in your home or on your desk at work. Ironically, we reverted back to the data storage centers because the idea was that if you actually could collect servers in a particular place, you could run parallel processing with respect to unused elements of the computing power and dramatically increase what you could do um, from the standpoint of computing and storage. And so we are now back actually almost where we began with huge server farms, which are the cloud, but which have the ability to, to simply move data from one point to another and to process it readily based upon where it is that there's some time and some space available. With all this, as you know, the cloud is not really in the clouds. It has to be somewhere. So the servers have to be located somewhere. And one of the elements of the internet that often gets overlooked is the fact that it's built upon a physical infrastructure. At the end of the day, the servers, the, the, the major cables that run under the ocean that allow us to transit data from, let's say, North America to Europe or Asia or vice versa. These are physical things, and they exist in physical space, as do the various elements of the infrastructure that allow you to communicate wirelessly. And this becomes important because although I've said that the data of the internet is borderless, it moves freely and rapidly around the world from point to point, it actually lies on a bed or an infrastructure that does have to exist in a physical space. The servers will be located some places. The cables and the other physical communications infrastructure will be located someplace. That may be driven by engineering issues or where the climate is good or where there are no natural uh, hazards, but there could be political elements that enter into that decision. And that's one of the elements we'll talk a little bit about here as we discuss how we govern the internet in a world divided up among sovereigns. I should say, by the way, that this was a very central focus of what CG did in the program they supported with the Global Commission on Internet Governance. Um, I was privileged to be a member of that group. Uh, I was cha chaired by Carl Bildt, who was the former prime minister of Sweden. Uh, Gordon Smith from CG was the vice chair. Fenn was working with it. Uh, we had a broad group of representatives from uh, North America, Europe, Africa, South America. And the idea was to address some of these issues and talk in particular about how we govern an internet that is global and that maintains trust with the people that use it. So there's a, um, a kind of a cartoon. It's one of my favorite cartoons that ran maybe a decade ago, maybe more, in the New Yorker magazine. <clears throat> it shows two dogs in front of a PC, personal computer. And one dog says to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> and, that, and that element of anonymity has been a feature of the internet from the very beginning because the people who built the internet knew each other. So they weren't worried about identifying themselves and they all trusted each other. That has turned out to be the Achilles heel of the internet because in a world in which anybody can connect up to the network and by default, anything connected to the network can be accessed unless you take steps to prevent it. In that world, trust is a critical factor and it's hard to know how to know whom to trust. Uh, part of that is because, generally speaking, identity is anonymous, unless you have a requirement that nobody can enter your site or log in without some form of identification. Typically, that's the password. Uh, more and more, it's becoming a biometric. But the problem of identity and trust really lies at, at the core of the internet. Not surprisingly, that flaw in the internet was rapidly discovered by criminals. Um, you know, there's the old story of Willie Sutton, the bank robber, and they said, well, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. And the money is now on the internet. The criminals discovered that pretty rapidly. Um, what we've seen on the internet with criminality is um, not terribly different in character from what we see in the real world, but it is very different in scale. So we've always had bank robbers and bank cheats, but we haven't had very much like what we saw with the Bank of Bangladesh a year ago, where the Federal Reserve Bank of New York received instructions that purported to be from the Bank of Bangladesh with stolen credentials, seeking to have a billion dollars 
transferred to accounts in the Philippines. And about 100 million, a little less than 100 million, made it over there. And finally, somebody noticed a spelling error in the instructions, and they said, ooh, maybe there's a problem with this. A couple years ago, we had a circumstance where an organized crime group hacked into uh, two companies in India that were managing the software for ATM withdrawal cards. And they altered the software <coughs> so that it was possible to produce counterfeit ATM cards that had no cash limit in terms of withdrawal. The only limit was the amount of money in the machine itself. On a single day, this group had their agents go all around the world to banks and use the cards to withdraw approximately $10 million. So again, not different than what we've seen before, but hugely greater in scale. But it's not just been an issue of crime. We've seen the issue of uh, theft of intellectual property. We've seen more recently the use of uh, the ability to hack into data to get personal identifiable information, like the 500 million accounts on Yahoo, a theft of uh, identity information that is actually going to wind up requiring a restructuring of the acquisition of Yahoo because the value of the company is less. We've seen theft of intellectual property. We've seen occasions where, because we are now beginning to connect up actual physical control systems to the internet, we've seen circumstances where uh, people hack into a system and destroy data and destroy machines. That happened in uh, 2012 in Saudi Arabia when Saudi Aramco was hacked, presumably by Iranian sympathizers, and 30,000 machines and the data on them were destroyed. Last Christmas in the Ukraine, uh, the lights went out for a couple hundred thousand people because some folks, presumably from Russia, hacked in and destroyed and shut down the operations of a couple of transmission stations. And this issue about actually getting into control systems has now been demonstrated to be an issue with respect to automobiles, which are wirelessly connected uh, outside of the, the car itself, uh, pacemakers, uh, insulin pumps, and presumably can apply to all kinds of devices that are, quote, smart and in your home. So with the issue of trust and the issue of security now moving to the front, um, we now have to ask ourselves, can the internet be made safe for people to use? Or are people going to wind up backing away from the internet because they're afraid that if they transact business or if they have personal communications um, or they have significant business plans that are in any way networked up, that those are going to be stolen and they're going to be victimized. At the same time, the internet is hugely positive in a number of ways. Um, <clears throat> it has been an amazing facilitator of global trade. We now have something called the gig economy, where people actually are able to eliminate transaction costs and market themselves directly to customers. You see that with Uber, where people can literally arrange to be uh, picked up by people simply using the internet to connect them. You have Airbnb. You have businesses that are built upon the ability to market directly around the world. And that's a tremendous spur to global trade. I would argue in some ways the internet now is what the sea was for many centuries before. It is a global commons, which is the foundation through which trade and travel occur. So we don't want to lose this element, even as we deal with the element of security. So that really raises the a uh, series of questions. Who takes responsibility for securing this on the internet? To the extent that the internet is a global commons, who governs it? Because even though some people like to talk about the internet as being uh, you know, kind of an unregulated uh, area outside the law, the truth is, like anything else, the internet has to have a law. There has to be a consistent set of standards and rules about how you go from point A to point B, how the domain naming system operates, um, what, how the infrastructure interconnects, how wireless operates. All these things need to have governing standards and rules. Are these going to become politicized, or are they merely going to be technical issues? And perhaps fundamental to all of these questions, how do we maintain trust in the internet um, and thereby get the benefits of the global commons without having all of the detriments of uh, criminality and even terrorism uh, that we have seen in the last several years. <clears throat>
So let me deal with a number of topics that address this. And I don't have answers necessarily, but I put them out there as things that I think are, are part of the discussion. So I begin with maybe the most basic question of governance, which I mentioned a, mo a moment ago. How do you direct the traffic? You know, if I have my car, I have the ability to drive pretty much wherever I want. But I still need to have lanes in the road. I need to have stoplights. I need to know which direction I'm going in. If we don't have those kinds of rules, we're going to have a lot of car crashes, and pretty soon no one's going to take the roads. So we need to have the same thing with the internet. And that naming and numbering system was, until this past October, operated by a corporation called ICANN, the International Corporation for Names and Numbering, that worked with a contract with the US Department of Commerce. And the idea was this would organize and manage the overall architecture of how we name and number and index and route all of the internet traffic. You might think this is purely a technical issue, and it is in many ways just technical. But you know, there's a, embedded within it the potential for abuse in politics. For example, if someone wanted to prevent you from going to uh, political sites that they didn't like, um, and they were able to control the numbering system, they could simply make it impossible to find the number or the IP address of that particular site. Or they could assign it with a, pref a suffix that was distinctive that would allow, it would allow a company, a, rather a country, to block anything going to that site simply because it would be easy to detect based on the suffix. So by managing the rules of the road, you can not merely make traffic move easily, you can actually direct it to or away from certain locations. This issue of the US government um, supervision of ICANN became a, a something of a source of controversy, and I think it frankly was exacerbated by the Snowden revelations, which fueled the idea that somehow the US, although it was essentially the generator of the internet, was now unfairly dominating it. And certain countries, like Russia and China, um, found it very much in their interest to complain that the US couldn't be trusted. And therefore, this ought to be turned over to the UN or UN body, uh, where it would be a multi-government approach to governing it. Um, those of us who looked at the composition of the UN scratched our heads and said, well, you know, a lot of those countries really aren't big fans of freedom of speech. If we're going to be taking votes in the General Assembly on how we manage the internet, there's not going to be a lot of free speech. And therefore, and this was something the Commission, Global Commission, really pushed on, the thought was, look, we ought to have, we ought to devolve from the US. Um, it, we lay ourselves open to criticism if the US insists on holding on to ICANN, but we ought to move it to a multi-stakeholder model in which all of the users in the various categories of those who interact on the internet have a say in the governance. And what that will do is prevent political considerations from overwhelming considerations, uh, considerations of utility, trust, and fairness. There was a little controversy in the US. There were some people who argued, no, no, you're giving control of the internet up to people who shouldn't have it. But I think wiser heads prevailed that in many ways, by surrendering the control, we actually made a powerful point about soft power and trust that in the long run benefited the values we in the US and Canada and in other Western countries subscribe to. So as of October 1, that transition occurred. Um, but there are other issues that are, are, have not been resolved. And I'll go through a number of them. One is, what is the obligation of a country, given the fact that, as I said, the physical elements still have to be located somewhere in physical space, what is the obligation of a country to make sure its borders, within its borders, don't, be, don't arise platforms for criminal activity or even terrorist activity? We know, for example, <clears throat> if, we're, if we see a country that is hosting terrorist actors and they're launching missiles, or bombs at us, the terrorist actors, we say to the government of the country, it's your responsibility to shut that down or we'll shut it down for you. That, of course, was why we went into Afghanistan in 2001. How does that work in cyberspace? What is the obligation of a country to prosecute and shut down criminals and terrorists who are launching attacks outside of its own borders? I would say there's a mixed response to this. The US takes it seriously, Canada takes it seriously, most Western countries do. In certain countries in the world, there's sometimes a tacit um, looking away 
from criminality because the people who are engaged in criminal activity one day wind up acting as agents of the state, hacking for state purposes on other days. Sometimes countries don't have the capability to actually enforce the law in their own borders. So this issue about the responsibility of states to police within their borders, activities that are gonna generate results in other countries, this issue remains a serious problem in the internet. And one of the questions we have to resolve is to what extent if a country doesn't take care of threats emanating from within its own sovereign space, some other country that's been victimized can take care of it for them. And that is an issue about collateral damage and where third parties have a right to say, listen, we're gonna go in there and fix a problem if you can't fix it yourself. Allied to that is the issue of lawful access <clears throat> to data that happens to be held in a server that's not the same country as the criminal offense or the litigation in question is taking place. So let's say I'm a prosecutor in the US and I'm investigating a terrorist here in the US um, who's carried out an attack in the US and I wanna get the data in their uh, cell phone and I wanna get the data in their other devices like their laptop. But the data's in the cloud and the cloud is not really in the clouds, it's on a server farm somewhere in Ireland. So. I go to the company that has the uh, ability to control the data and I say, here's a search warrant. I want to search, you have to do it for me, and pull all the data that relates to this from the uh, particular, emanating from the particular individual under investigation. The company, and this is based on a real case, the company says, well, listen, the server's in Ireland. It's kind of like a bank safety deposit box. Um, you have to go to the Irish judge to get the Irish judge to give a warrant and then we'll answer the Irish judge. Um, that is an issue that's been litigated in the US. Right now, the courts that have considered it have sided with the company, but that may not be the end of the day. In Brazil, for example, they've actually put company officials in jail because the Brazilian judges asked for data held in the US that was not legally transmissible to, to Brazil and therefore, Brazil said, well, you're operating here. Your, your, your agent is here. We're going to put the agent in jail until you give us the data. This issue of lawful access t turns on the question of do we govern how we respond to legal requests based upon the location of the data, which ought to be driven by engineering or similar circumstances, or do we find a more universal criterion that we could agree, or at least most of us could agree, or to govern whether something is turned over or not and what law applies. For example, I've argued that the citizenship of the data producer or the citizenship of the data owner or even the citizenship of the data subject ought to determine what law applies so that you don't drive people to host data on servers based upon whether they think they're gonna get a favorable result from a particular location but rather you look to the country that has the greatest interest, namely the country of citizenship. We're not there yet. Um, the US and Britain have had a, do have an agreement involving sharing and responding to requests that begins that process, but I do think this issue of organizing lawful access is again gonna become a critical issue, not only for making sure we have a standardized version of the law, but to make sure that our global internet platforms don't get literally caught between two conflicting legal regimes with uh, difficult results for everybody. A related element is what about the substantive law that governs how we deal with data? The Europeans, for example, the European court has conjured up a right to be forgotten, which means that if <clears throat> someone petitions and says it's unfair to have my past bankruptcy or my past misbehavior um, searchable on the internet. Um, the court has ruled that you can get that taken down from a search engine that operates in, in Europe, and therefore no one can find that because it's unfair to let someone exhume that old piece of data. Now, of course, those of us following the current presidential election, where we're back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, I can imagine if we had a right to be forgotten here, the candidates would be full-time exercising that right. But what happens, so that, that's the right to be forgotten in Europe. What happens when 
that same person says, well, wait a second. I'm getting the right to be forgotten if you search from Germany or France, but what if someone's in the US and they search me? I also want to have that shut down. And I, the European Court, I believe, is taking the position that, that can be, they can order the search engine to shut that down as well. Now think about that from our standpoint. In the US or in Canada, where we have free speech, the idea that a, a presidential candidate could require the internet service provider, the search engine, to shut down anybody who was searching that candidate's biography and discovering something bad about them, we would view that as a direct impact on our free speech. There are other countries where it's illegal to take certain political views. Some of them are in Europe, some of them are in China or in Russia. Now they can control to some extent within their own domain, rightly or wrongly, whether those views can be shown. But do they have a right to say to the company, you can't have those views aired in the United States or in Canada? I think we're gonna see more of this as we, as we develop, um, partly because the internet is spreading and partly because the impulse to authoritarianism is actually growing in the world. You know, we see things in Turkey involving shutting down the media. We see in the Philippines somebody who's now being uh, hostile to the media. Uh, dare I say we see someone south of the border that's not a big fan of the media if they disagree with them. So I think this problem is gonna become, again, more urgent. A last issue uh, is localization in general. Uh, the impulse, some of it being economic protectionism, some of it being outgrowth of the features I talked about earlier, to require that the data of a citizen be held within the borders of the country of citizenship. And again, that defeats the engineering principle in terms of where you locate, locate the data and subordinates it to a political principle. All of these elements taken together um, threaten the scope of the internet, the global commons. It would be a little bit as if everybody chopped the ocean up and required you to pay a toll or get permission to transit across the Atlantic or the Pacific. Um, one last area I'll talk about before I throw it open for questions. Um, there's discussion about the impact of the internet in the law of armed conflict. We know what war is in the physical world. And we built a um, deterrent strategy and a, a military strategy around the idea that we can detect who launches an attack and we then respond according to what our doctrine is. In terms of nuclear deterrence, we always assumed that if someone launched on us, we would see the launch or we would see the bombers coming and we would know who, to whom to attribute the attack and we would respond accordingly. That attribution is not as easy in cyberspace. It's very easy to fly under a false flag. And it's also very easy if you want to launch malware against the system to do it not from your home country, but even from the country where you're targeting. Because you send someone with a thumb drive who has the malware on the thumb drive, and they go and they sit in a hotel room, and they launch from inside the country that's the target. And as we see more and more that industrial control systems are being connected um, so that you could actually take down the financial system, a power plant, a water plant, a dam. We have to start asking ourselves, how would the laws of armed conflict apply in cyberspace? How would you measure what's collateral damage? Um, how do you deal with the fact that an attack might come, might hop through a number of your intermediate points on the way to the final target? Are these points part of the battlefield or are they not part of the battlefield? These are issues that are beginning to be discussed. The Talon Manual, which was issued a couple years ago in NATO, is an effort to begin, begin to think through the doctrine and the law on cyber conflict. But again, it's an area which I'm not sure we will have fully developed before we actually get tested. One subsidiary part of that, which I will mention because it's very much in the news, is what is sometimes called hybrid warfare or information warfare. Um, you know, when we talk about cybersecurity, we think about protecting the code and the software and the hardware to make sure it's accurate, it's not interfered with, it's not degraded or corrupted, and it's not overwhelmed with a, de with a denial of service attack. But if you go to Russia and you ask them about cybersecurity, and I actually have a book, which I was given when I was in Moscow a few months ago that actually lays this out, Part of what they believe cybersecurity is, is keeping bad ideas 
uh, or subversion, or what they regard as subversion, out of their domains. At the same time, as we've seen in Europe, and I think we're now seeing in the US in the election, part of Russian military doctrine, and even Chinese military doctrine, is to shape the battlefield by affecting public opinion and subverting the way people feel about their government or about fighting against an adversary. Do we treat this as First Amendment free speech in the US or whatever the analog is here? Do we treat it as a form of weaponizing information? Um, how do we balance these issues? Um, again, this is a feature of a world in which the weapon is not physical, but it is data that transits over time and space. So the internet is a very positive thing. <clears throat> there is a great set of opportunities that emanate from it, but it is by no means an unalloyed good. And the series of decisions we make about how we regulate it, how we govern it, how we respect privacy, but how we secure it, will determine whether 10 years from now the internet has reached the flower of its promise, not only here but around the world, or whether it's kind of, you know, basically an interesting toy that you can use to net stream movies or, you know, make restaurant reservations. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Very brief question. What if? What? What if? What if? Wow, okay. Um, well, uh, <laughs> what if what? Um, you know, I, I, I actually think that if we don't handle this properly, I, wasn't be, I was not being facetious, uh, the internet will move back to being a novelty. Um, I think we're already in danger of uh, people moving beyond what I consider to be appropriate skepticism about what they do online into actual fear about doing things online. Um, now, you know, I don't regret there being things that have caused people to become more cautious. For example, I look at the emails that have been leaked by WikiLeaks, and, you know, I'm saying to myself, why would anyone not encrypt their email at rest and thereby know that if someone steals it, it's gibberish? So um, it may be that a certain limited amount of this aggravated behavior will promote good cyber hygiene and better attention being paid to security. On the other hand, what I would hate to see happen is people become so overwhelmed and uncertain about what to do, and there's so many solutions out there, that they throw their hands up. I mean, one of the things that I do, I do in my day job um, is work with boards on cybersecurity and try to convey the following message. You can't eliminate the risk, but you can manage the risk. The important decisions are not what things you buy to put on the network. It's what your governance is, what your strategy is, and how you architect your system. The technology will enable that, but it is not a substitute for it. And if you have a manageable set of expectations and you've thought through what are your critical assets and what your architecture and your governance is. Then the technology allows you to minimize the risk of something very damaging. And a large part of this, by the way, is training people, including your employees or your family, and basic things you do and don't on the internet. Um, it's not the neighborhood bar. You don't just say whatever you feel like over a drink. You have to understand it's preserved. So I think there are things we can do to make sure we steer in the direction of trust but we need to do a better job educating people about that. My name is Miguel. I'm coming from Algeria. Thank you very much for your uh, thorough presentation and the views that you expressed. I do understand that there is uh, many layers in the internet system. And when it comes to responsibility, it's very difficult to see who should be taken responsible, the users, the companies, the uh, research engines, and indeed internet itself. My question is as follow. Do you see any need to have an international legal 
framework to survey and monitor internet when it comes to risks affecting peace and stability, propaganda, incitement to violence and terrorism. And lastly, what is your view on what it is termed the dark net? Okay, great, great question. So first let me explain <coughs> what the dark net is. Generally speaking, when you think of the internet, you think what is um, searchable with a search engine like Google or what, Yahoo or whatever. That's only like a tiny fraction of what is actually connected up to the internet. There's what they call the deep web. Uh, that is uh, all the sites that are not searchable, they're not part of a, a searchable index. Many of them are private or proprietary and, and there's nothing nefarious about them. But there's a category that we call the dark web where people use anonymity to hide themselves so they can engage in criminal transactions. You have marketplaces, like there was one called Silk Road, which is now in its third iteration, where you can literally buy drugs, child pornography, you can even hire people for murder, and they use an anonymizing tools that mask the IP address of the originating and receiving um, server by hopping it through a number of anonymous servers on an intermediate layer. And there's controversy about do you regulate this? Do you try to shut it down? In Austria, ironically, it's illegal to have your servers used for this. In other countries, uh, they don't make it illegal, but they try to monitor it. Ironically, the US government invented it. It was meant to be a way to protect dissidents from being identified by oppressive governments. But rapidly, like with anything else, the criminals figured out a way to exploit it. So uh, there's a, a lot of debate about this. I do think that we do need to be aware of what's going on in the dark web. Um, I don't know that I would say to shut it down, but I do think that policing it using a variety of law enforcement techniques is important. Now, I think you raise a more general question, and I would say this. I think we need to have norms to consider things like, obviously things like you know contraband like child pornography, um, dealing with terrorist recruiting, dealing with attacks on infrastructure or, or theft. We have a series of individual national laws, and we have a series of treaties and reciprocal agreements. And I think that building on that network is, is a, an important thing to do. Recognizing, though, that we are going to hit some areas where we don't agree. Uh, there are going to be some countries that say, I don't want I criticism of the, well, for example, in Turkey. Apparently, it's a crime to criticize the president of Turkey. Uh, and if you had the Turks say, well, we want to make it a criminal offense to criticize a national leader, I don't know that we would get a treaty or, uh, or a, an international norm that would agree to that. But there are certainly things we can agree to, and I think that some of the obvious criminality, um, you know, uh, acts of war that would destroy hospitals or things of that sort, I think we could reach agreement on. Uh, I will say when I was in Russia, notwithstanding the tension that exists between the US and Russia, you know, they did, the authorities I spoke to did make the point of saying they'd like to see a hotline so that if there was something that occurred in cyberspace that was potentially dangerous, that was inadvertent, you could call up and say, something's out there, we need to be able to warn you so we can shut it down, similar to what we did during the Cold War. I don't think you're going to get an overarching international law. I don't think that's possible or desirable. But I do think the network effect, where countries work together to, to synchronize laws on things we can agree on are, are part of what we need to do to protect the rules of the road on the internet. But always to make sure it doesn't get subordinated to a political agenda that's fundamentally incompatible. Last thing I would say is this. Everybody has a role to play in this. It's not just government. The companies that manage the platforms and the backbone need to be able to demonstrate that they are fair, impartial, and abide by the rule of law. And individuals need to take responsibility for making sure they're maintaining their own systems. If people who are on the network don't do the basic things you need to do for cyber hygiene, then they're actually not only hurting themselves, but they're hurting their colleagues and their friends as well. John Noble, a retired Canadian diplomat. Could you say something more about the Build Commission on Internet Governance? I, it seems to have 
gone off the radar. And what it, has it reported? What are the next steps? Do you, what, what's going to happen? Okay, great question. Um, we issued a report a few months ago. It was uh, presented to the OECD. It was presented to the UN. Uh, we did a number of media outreach items. Our, we had a series of recommendations really built around trust. One of them was the migration of ICANN into this multi-stakeholder model. But others really talked about having a kind of a, a compact of trust or a social compact with users. How do you reconcile, um, for example, the desire for security with concerns about privacy? Are they intention? No, or they really complement each other? Uh, what about encryption? Should encryption be permitted or should it be weakened? We said it should be permitted and not weakened. Um, you know, we put out a number of different things like that. And the report is out there. I think it is something that we're trying to get out and socialize, frankly, through events like this. I'm going to go to London in, in a few weeks and talk about it as well. I'm sure we can get it. It's online. It's on the internet. Um, and the idea is to move the discussion forward. I think maybe the most interesting thing about it was this. We had a lot of, st of, of people from different walks of life. <coughs> you had me. I'm from a security background. You had David Omand who used to be head of the Joint Intelligence Committee in GCHQ uh, in Britain. But you also had people who were from civil society and real civil libertarians. And what was remarkable is we came to a, a, a real consensus. Uh, it was not tipped strongly in the direction of anarchy, nor was it stripped, a, a, a tipped strongly in the direction of heavy regulation. There was a regulation that, a recognition we needed to have government protect the internet, but not in a way that's heavy-handed or overbearing or undercuts the feature of trust. There also was a discussion about the need to make sure we're pushing the infrastructure out to Africa and other parts of the world that are underserved, uh, because otherwise we wind up really with two worlds, a wired world and a non-wired world. So I commend the report. I think we were all very pleased with a degree of consensus. And they're very practical conclusions. They're not in the sky stuff. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I'm really quite intrigued with your thought that the internet could split apart into several internets. Would that be something like um, a series of companies, the way our cable and satellite systems work? You could be with one or the other. Um, and if something like that happened, would it not be W would you still not have the possibility that some would be more <coughs> serious and you could have your, your systems that dealt with trade or security and others that dealt with movies and music? And if I can just get a little political, could I ask you whether you have any concerns with one candidate or the other in terms of how these issues play themselves out? So as to the, fir as to the first issue in terms of localization, um, you know, I think you could have a spectrum of things. You know, you could have localization that requires data to be for the country citizens to be held in the country, but otherwise allows the data to move freely. Um, you know, that would be inefficient because you would lose some of the benefits of scale that you get with the cloud, but it wouldn't necessarily be fatal. On the other hand, if you look at the Great Wall of China, Firewall of China, um, the Chinese really try very hard to limit the ability of people to go in and out of the networks in China to visit other places. Now, that gets circumvented through virtual private networks. But imagine that more countries started to do that. And then what you would have is your ability to communicate or search outside your own country would become very circumscribed. And that would have a fundamental uh, impact on the internet. By the way, there's an interesting thing arising in China now, which is a kind of a soft coercion. You know how your credit score, like if you want to borrow, you can get online and get your financial credit score. They're coming up with a social credit score. And the social credit score will be developed by monitoring all the activity you do online. What sites do you visit? When you say things, what do you say? Who are your friends? What do your friends do? And if you're kind of in the zone that the regime likes, your social credit score goes up. You can be proud. Uh, you may get certain privileges. You'll get certain favorable treatment. And if you're associating with people that are not so well-liked or you're visiting sites that are not really endorsed, your social credit score goes down. Now, no one's actually shutting down what you do. 
but there's in a soft way coercion, coercing you about what you do and what you don't do. Um, I think we ought to look at that as well. That's a relatively new phenomenon. Um, these are all ways that can affect the, the internet. Uh, you know, this has not been a big issue in the presidential campaign. Um, and um, I don't know that either candidate said much about the internet. I'm, I'm quite sure after the experience that the Clinton campaign has had, they're gonna be very attuned to the issue of cybersecurity and cyber norms. Um, I don't know that the Trump campaign thinks about it or cares about it very much. So I'd be just guessing, really, with respect to what they would say. Swenyashevsky, I'm also a retired diplomat. I was going to ask you a question about black kettles and black pots inside the Beltway, but I'll restrain myself. Uh, when I was in China and I had my computer installed, the Chinese uh, technician said, so you want to watch the uh, capitalist websites? I said, sure. Here's a VPN. And they'll catch you in about three months, and here's my card, and I'll come back and you can set you up with another one. There's always a way around. And that's part of the trouble here, yeah. isn't it? In North Korea, when I was there periodically, uh, I saw grade school kids writing code. That's the reality. And so bad guys are going to be ahead of the curve. If you think about it, the number of countries that are truly involved and dependent on the internet is quite small. And I'm thinking here of the kind of negotiations that took place at the, uh, and during the Cold War, at the height of the Cold War, after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that restrained the development and use of nuclear weapons in ways that was constructive, and largely because in the CD in Geneva, mm -hmm. there were only, I think, 19 countries at the time. That becomes a manageable negotiation. I know people in Africa won't like it, but it becomes manageable. Is that a way forward? Well, you know, one of the challenges is this. I think, um, by definition, the number of countries that had the capability to put together a nuclear weapon, had the technology, and, and the ability to invest in it was n certainly not, by any means, a majority of countries in the world. As you just said a moment ago, you know, you can be writing code in North Korea, and the asymmetry of the ability to weaponize on the internet makes it much, much more difficult. That being said, I mean, I think you could bring together in uh, uh, countries that are kind of the major developers, operators, and innovators in the area of infrastructure, in the area of, of the internet, and you could reach some norms. So I'm not saying that's out of the question. I think that the bigger challenge is this. Russia and China have to be part of this. They have very different views, as I said earlier, about what is considered to be a cybersecurity problem and what isn't. And I believe that there are probably some things we could agree on. I think, for example, we could probably get the Russians and the Chinese to agree you don't cause airliners, civilian airliners, to fall out of the air and crash. But as you start to get to things that are a little more value-laden, like the ability to you know, read newspapers or visit things that are, are uh, you know, perhaps critical of a regime, um, you might find <clears throat> a somewhat different attitude. Also, as we can see now in, in the physical world is developing both in Asia and Europe, you know, the Russians often view things that we see as defensive, they view it as offensive, like the you know, anti-missile uh, um, array that you know, is, is currently in the Far East or what we're putting in terms of anti-missile launchers in, in uh, parts of Europe. So, I mean, I, my view on this is it's always worth trying to build up trust incrementally. There's probably some low-hanging fruit that we could get a general agreement on, um, but we need to be realistic and understand there are some things that are probably not gonna be doable given the existing disparities and views on some of these fundamental issues. Could I ask a subsidiary? Trust seems to be critical for right. such a process. How do you think the Snowden revelations, revelations affect that with respect to the US? You know, um, I think Snowden did a lot of damage. And um, let me, um, I have my own suspicions 
that he was manipulated, um, maybe unwittingly, uh, into doing what he did. But his professed concern with the uh, metadata program <clears throat> does not nearly explain the volume of material he took or what he did with it. Um, I would still think it was wrong if he'd stolen the 215 data, the metadata uh, um, uh, information, but at least I would have understood there was a consistency to it. I don't see that consistency. Much of what he did was to, and often I think exaggerated or distorted, present a negative picture about what the U.S. does. Um, and I think it's eroded a lot of confidence in the U.S. companies. Now, wh where are we now with respect to the Snowden revelations? Well, first of all, I do think, you know, there were some, one thing that ensued from this that was, I think, a good thing. But let me f hasten to say, you know, the fact that something good came out of this does not mean it was good to do. I mean, I, if I killed someone, maybe there'd be, a, you know, the lesson would be, wow, we ought to, you know, ban guns, and therefore, look, a good thing came out of my shooting somebody. We wouldn't say that shooting them was a good thing. But one of the things that emerged is we did release and put out in the public uh, slightly redacted opinions of the court that supervises electronic surveillance. I don't think there was a, a, a cost to security in putting it out. And I think what it did do is actually serve a useful function in educating the public that we do very carefully supervise and regulate these powers. So I mean, I think that more transparency is a partial solution. I think the companies are now making an effort to not be uncooperative, but to say to the government, we will supply you with what you want, but we're going to require you to be strictly and visibly complying with the law. And that's probably a good thing. It's a little bit of a headache for the authorities, but that's worth it to inspire trust. Um, I think also some of the impact of the revelations is worn off because, to be honest, I hate to put it this way, the more bombs and shootings that go on in Europe, the more the Europeans go, hmm, maybe we do want to have a little bit of a look at metadata. So, I mean, I think these things will balance out in the end. Thank you, sir. I have someone at the back. There's someone back there who'd like to ask the last question. Hi, it's Alec McKenzie, actually a medical researcher here at the Children's Hospital. So taking it as a medical model, uh, uh, could it be that this is just sort of a, a chronic disease that one gets and, and it's just a part of the prognosis and the patient will carry on? Um, what, the what internet is the disease or the criminality? The internet, the internet is, the, is, the, uh, is the actual uh, corpus, uh, the healthy positive entity and this is just a a chronic, debilitating, low-level thing that just goes on. And, and, and those examples that you've cited are case reports, but as far as a real systematic review of the health of the body, I is it failing? And, and in point of fact, it's such a large, amorphous thing. What metrics does one look at <coughs> uh, to really gauge how it's faring? Well, those are good questions. And let me tell you, I use, I'm gonna, I use the medical and the human body model in a slightly different way when I talk okay. about this. <clears throat> I say to people, you know, a lot of times you, you go to clients or whatever and they say, we don't want to be hacked. And um, can, can you give us something that we'll put on the network we won't be hacked? I said, that's not possible. I said, think of the human body. The human body is designed to keep out bacteria and viruses, but not 100%. Yeah. And it's configured with the expectations that there will be some bacteria and viruses that will, you'll ingest, and your white blood cells will characterize harmful, not harmful, and if it's harmful, it'll kill them. And actually, this, when you get sick, yeah. provided you're not immune compromised, it actually makes you yeah. better because you develop more code that you can look for. Not, In fact, not bad for a non-medic. Right, and, <laughs> and, and to, to torture the analogy even further, vaccinations, like your flu vaccine, that's information sharing. That's sharing the code of a new virus with your white blood cells. I, 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 the reason I like to use this analogy is because I think it's to your point. Um, you don't go to the doctor and say, I never want to be sick. Mm -hmm. And you don't expect that that's what you're going to have. What you want to do is be able to recover. You ideally like to get immunized if you can prevent something. Mm 
Um, but basically, you expect illness to be part of life. What you want to do is minimize the consequences. And that's the approach I take to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And I think it gives you a balanced and realistic philosophy of how to secure your networks. Right, but so how do you take the temperature of the whole thing versus just that company? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it that way. You know, I think that right now I would st still say that, um, you know, the, the whole thing is doing well. But, uh, of course, the problem is, you know, that's a macro yeah. picture. We all live in the micro world of our own lives. Um, Michael, I think it's uh, safe to say that you've hit on the policy challenge of a generation. And the question you posed to us was, how do you effectively govern the internet, which is a technology that's premised on borderlessness within a, si a, a system of state sovereignty that's predicated on borders? Um, and I think that the stakes couldn't be higher to get the policy mix right. We're talking about uh, the greatest wealth generation tool that the world has ever known, the greatest communication tool that the world has ever known. Uh, a, a force for good in the world and a force for human rights. Uh, and if, it, if the policy is not uh, designed properly, uh, we face a significant disadvantage. So I will just say this, I'm comforted by the fact that there's brilliant minds like yours that have turned to it. Thank you so much for such a brilliant, uh, a brilliant presentation. Uh, you've done uh, uh, the, this audience a service and certainly CG a service as well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. And Thank you for being here. And, and words, uh, the words couldn't provide uh, enough thanks. So uh, Fen Hansen has a small token of our appreciation. Now, I, I hope it's not a liquid or I'll never get it on the plane. Uh, um, Michael, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, and I hope I'm not giving away any secrets, but you mentioned your, that your wife said to you before you came up to Canada, you better look at real estate depending on the outcome of the election. Um, this isn't a piece of real estate, but it is a piece of uh, northern carved rock from, uh, from uh, our very high north, and uh, I hope it will thank you grace very much. Uh, your desk. Thank or you very much. I so appreciate that. Really good. Thank you. Thank you very much.